Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar, Industrialising Fill and Finish for Advanced Therapies, the Benefits of Automation, hosted in partnership with Optima. I am Georgie Makin, the editor at Facilitate and moderator for today's discussion. Today I'm joined by a great panel who will shortly be introduced to you, but before we get started, I just wanted to take a second to run through a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, I would just like to remind you that the latter half of this session is reserved for an interactive Q&A discussion, so please do submit your questions via the Q&A widget accessible via the bottom of your screen. We will also attempt to answer your questions offline should we run out of time. This session is being recorded and will be available on demand shortly after the conclusion of the event, details for which will be sent to you once the recording is available. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our panellists. We are delighted to welcome Andrea Traub, Nick, Nick Dye, Tezfu Mezagebi, Mateusz Polowski, Lars Waldman, uh, sorry, Lars Waldman and Tatiana Nanda to the panel today. I will now hand over to Andrea to start today's session. Georgi, good morning and good afternoon also from my side. My name is Andrea Traube. I'm the Director of Business Development at Optima Pharma, and I would like to welcome you as well on our webinar today for the industrialization of fill and finish for advanced therapies. I would like to start with a question. Are we already in a position to produce those therapies on an industrial scale as the industry wants to move away from lab scale or small scale um, processing to commercial manufacturing? Do we have the necessary technologies in place? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and um, I think we all agree that uh, the industry wants to move away from a, a manual open processing to a closed, to an automated closed one. And maybe at the second question, what can we learn from the biologics or monoclonal antibody development and production optimization? Uh, 20 years ago. Some people talk about similarities, but is this really the case? I think when we talk about cell and gene therapies, uh, we have to be aware that we talk about uh, living material, especially for cell therapies. However, th uh, think about, we can uh, uh, adapt already well-established technologies uh, in the industry to the specific requirements of advanced therapies. To name some challenges we have, we have high value product where we want to save really the last droplet uh, of solution. We have small batch sizes and even different products with a frequent changeover. And one point which is really important, I think, for those kind of products is, and this is what I learned and experienced through, throughout my whole career, Cell and gene therapies require a really deep understanding of the product itself and also the processes around it. And therefore, I'm really happy that we gathered this knowledge uh, together here in this webinar with our industry expert panel. And a warm welcome to our speakers, and I look forward to an interesting and inspiring discussion. And with that, I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Nick. Please, Nick. Thanks, Andrea. <clears throat> so, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, to echo what Andrea said, um, you know, this field is is advancing quickly, and we are seeing pressures on process scale up from laboratory scale to meet the clinical demands um, of growing and larger, uh, you know, uh, indications. So, one of the things that has has kind of come out in the field is that there's a supply demand mismatch. Um, this graph on the top left is a forecast from uh, Bio International. This is actually uh, a little old from 2018, um, but it shows that there's going to be a significant demand to supply uh, mismatch. So there's a lot of pressure for scaling up these processes. The similarities, particularly with in vivo gene therapy, um, gives some. Uh, avenue, almost a background to scale up linearly. Unfortunately, the differences in complexities of our vector, vector manufacturing um, limit that scale up and are easily uh, overlooked or potentially uh, accelerated beyond optimization. 
Another limitation that we've seen is that with viral vectors, there's a limited amount of um, knowledge on cleaning validation and cleaning protocols for vector carryovers. So most of the companies that I've worked with are really looking to um, use single use technology, which has a limitation on scale of about 2000 liters at, at maximum. Um, and it also impacts some of the downstream processes where uh, ultra centrifugation has been used to eliminate impurities, but that's also not scalable. Um, to that, when we scale linearly, one of the biggest um, challenges that we see is around transfection. So there's a number of different platforms that exist that are being developed in parallel to address this. But in looking at kind of the most common um, scaled up process to products that are approaching industrialization is uh, transient transfection. Um, and that's triple, tra uh, tri uh, sorry, triple plasma transient transfection. That carries very low yields, as you can see in this graph, which is um, just kind of a representation. What comes out of the bioreactor in the gross harvest after transfection is a heterogeneous mixture of um, capsids. Some of them are full, some of them are partial, and some of them are empty capsids that are, have no clinical benefit. So through the purification process, um, we need to start eliminating out these impurities in order to reach uh, a, a GMP grade um, uniform vector population with infectious particles that then even further limit the uh, number of particles that are actually uh, transducing cells at the end. So what we see is a significant reduction in scale from even the highest bioreactor transfection at 2000 liters um, down to what our end product is in bulk drug substance. Another pressure that's, um, oh, and sorry to add to that, the, the cost of goods for these reagents for plasmas is very high. So when you scale that up linearly, um, the cost of a production run can be extreme. And specifically the plasmids and the transfection reagents can account for about a third of the total production run. Um, then if you look at the market, so if we consider gene therapy a curative therapy, and, and that's a little questionable, I think, in the industry, but at least a durable therapy, it's going to change how the market looks, um, the market being our patient population. So if we address uh, unmet medical need, we can achieve um, you know, a, a population that represent, is represented by the prevalence of disease, but when curing that, we drop the market population down to the incidence. So there's gonna be a lot of pressure on companies to pivot to new indications um, as that market decreases um, successfully, which is the goal of what we're trying to do. Um, but unfortunately, it does mean that we're gonna see rapid change from product to product. Um, and as we change products in early stages, we're gonna see changes from more optimized platforms that are all kind of happening in, in parallel. So what does that mean to fill finish? Well, as Andrea said, we're going to see smaller volumes um, coming into fill finish. We're going to see more frequent batches because a lot of these batches can only support a couple patients, especially with systemic indications. And one of the big ones I think that's going to um, disrupt the market is going to be Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which is you know uh, very close to um, getting into clinical trials, some are already in clinical trials, and it's a larger population with a really high dose, which is different from what the original gene therapy design was, which was rare diseases and smaller doses. And so I think we'll see a, a challenge there. Um, and also frequent product changeovers. Because of the market and the pivoting between indications, we're going to have to, in fill finish, be able to accommodate frequent batches, but also changing products, changing um, parameters, um, different vial sizes, uh, and, and different um, you know, quality parameters. And then with this high cost of transfection and the significant amount of concentration that happens from your gross harvest to your bulk drug substance, all of these costs are concentrated significantly um, per vial. Um, so that really makes, puts a lot of pressure on Phil Finch, even at small scale operations, to have a lot of um, automated parameters to, 
to prevent a risk of error. So as these parameters change, having recipes that automatically switch between products is important. Probably the most significant is enhanced in process controls. And I know uh, Matthias is gonna touch on this uh, in more detail, but um, we always talk about, you know, zero reject and zero product loss, but, but that's so significant here with the high cost of goods that's built into each one. And then on the uh, back side of that, or the front side of that, the market cost of each of these files is extremely high. Um, with you know a dose right now benchmarked on Zolgensma being about $2.1 million per dose. So minimizing product loss at every stage of the fill um, is critical and, and automating each of these checks um, is gonna be very important. With all these switches and changeovers between products, um, process utilization analytics will be important to be able to see how our fill finish lines are being used um, how much downtime there is for changeover and how to minimize those different um, downtimes in order to maximize productivity. And then because of these changing products, um, there are automation um, benefits to simplify changeover. For example, uh, um, RFID tags for changeover parts or you know, certain guides that are built into the system that can it can help minimize risk of changeover and expedite changeover so that that process utilization is maximized for actually fill finish um, as opposed to you know, manipulating the machine to accommodate all these different products. This is a very large uh, subject that could take a lot more time and I tried to give a high level on it. Uh, hopefully you know, during the q and I can go a little bit more um, this is mostly based on AAV production and you know, triple transfection um, process, but there are a number of different platforms out there with Baclovirus and um, producer cell lines. And so essentially there's a lot of heterogeneity um, and that's going to have an impact on fill finish where it needs to be very adaptable. And I think that's where automation is going gonna, gonna to play a key role. That's the gist of it. I don't know if that took five minutes or not. Tesla, you need to start. You need to, okay. Okay. Is it um, my, my turn? Hello, hello everyone. I am Tesla uh, Tess Mukwege from uh, the Gen X Bio. Uh, I'll just walk through uh, very, very briefly uh, some challenges around formulation and uh, infiltration. Nick uh, talked about um, losses and, and trying to preserve every drop of uh, drug product because of the high value of the, this product. And that's, I think that's gonna be the theme throughout the presentation. And I, I definitely my presentation focus on that as well. So I have the, you know, just, just a couple of highlights of you know, areas where you tend to lose a lot of product and, and some potential mitigation strategies by, uh, this is not uh, complete this by any means, but just uh, a conversation starter. So in, in terms of formulation, you know, I come, my, my background is in, in biologics manufacturing, maps and vaccines where I'm used to working you know, in kilograms of uh, drug substance, um, you know, with two, 300 liter um, um, stainless steel tanks. So coming to uh, gene therapy where you have, you know, 10 ml and 15 ml, 20 ml of drug substance to work with, and you're trying to preserve every single drop of that to uh, ensure you have enough for you know, clinical uh, startup. So that's that's been that's a challenge on its own. Um, um, so around form, formula, formulation, you know, it's one of the challenges you run into is you have if you have a very low volume, what sort of containers do you use to compound or formulate? Um, some of the traditional um, square bottles are using um, uh, automated mixes with stir bars and, and stir plates. Those become a complete challenge when you're working again with such a small volume. So Typically, using um, 
blast and, and, and conical tubings with manual agitation, it's, it's your best bet here. I know it creates some challenges as, as you advance into later clinical trials, um, uh, late stage clinical trials, when you go into process validation, it becomes a lot of the manual process becomes a challenge to qualify. You don't have any defined parameters. Uh, so this is really a challenge with the agency as well as, as you advance. You know, how do you quantify this? How, how do you validate this? Uh, so you can't really follow the traditional qualification and, uh, and validation uh, guidelines. So a lot of interaction with uh, regulatory agencies. It's uh, an absolute must here in getting some clear gui guidance in advance of the process with, from, from agencies uh, as part of the best practice. Where you, where you lose in, in, in the drug product manufacturing for gene therapy, uh, your biggest losses most likely come from your filtration and your filling train assembly. So around filtration, really ensuring you have proper scale filter is, is, is a key there. Most of the, uh, the marketed filters, you know, they end at 20 centimeters square to you know, thousands of centimeters square. There aren't really very small, tiny centimeters that will, that will um, very low hold of volumes. So really ensuring you select the right filter to minimize your holdout volume uh, is, is key. Even with that, you, know, you, know, you have to saturate the filter with um, say formulation buffer or uh, a water, or in some cases, even in a product. So you are still going to lose some product, but there are, there are ways to still minimize that um, by ensuring, a couple, you know, by doing a couple things. One, you, know, um, you can have you know, uh, a purging system where, you, you know, you upstream of the filter, you are attached to a pressure feed, and you're applying really high pressure above the bubble point of the filter to make sure you're driving everything out. Um, a, you know, uh, to, to uh, make sure you don't have any residual, uh, whatever you use to flush the buffer, to flush the filter, that residual is uh, removed. And also, as you're doing your product filtration, make sure you're chasing every drop of product out of that filter so you're not leaving anything behind. Because if you don't do that, you're, you're looking at, even with the lowest filters, you're looking at, you know, potentially, 10, 15 mil uh, hold up in the, in the system, which in some cases, that may be your entire uh, drug, your entire batch size. Uh, another sort of challenging issue is the, the use of redundant filters. Uh, I know that's sort of the recommended, um, the industry recommended uh, guidance to use multi filters, two filters in series to do uh, filtration. I think for gene therapy, that becomes almost. Uh, an extreme challenge again. If you have a value, if you're working with volume less than, less than 50 mils, uh, it becomes very challenging. So, the only way that I see to, to overcome that again is to make sure you have some kind of purging system uh, upstream of each filter to be able to you know, drive as much of the product as possible. You still lose you know, maybe two or three mils in the membrane that, that you won't be able to chase, but at least it gives you an opportunity to, uh, to, um, to purge as much of the product uh, as possible. Um, with filtration, just sticking with filtration, you know, there's the talk about using you know, uh, pre-use membrane integrity, uh, it's mostly for biologics. I know the annex, uh, EU annex has been amended uh, to, to recommend pre-use membrane integrity testing. Really, I think for gene therapy, that's, that's uh, it's almost impossible. To, not, I don't want to say impossible, but it becomes a big challenge. So. Uh, in most cases, you're probably going to have to rely on bulk filtration where you filter the product uh, at once, confirm the membrane integrity before you proceed your, your filling. That way, at least you can use a, sing a single filter, you confirm your filter uh, as, as integral, and then you can proceed to, uh, to filling. So inline filtration for gene therapy products is, uh, <clears throat> is problematic. And then the other area uh, I think to consider is around uh, compatibility. You know, uh, bio vectors have a tendency to stick to uh, surfaces, um, to bio, you know, especially uh, glass surfaces, stainless steel surfaces. So if you're using stainless steel needles, or filling needles, or uh, you know, any stainless steel um, equipment in, in your process, take that into consideration that you may lose some vectors um, that are absorbed, absorbed into the surfaces. You, you know, you could also have vectors absorbing into the filter surfaces to make sure you've done some studies um, to ensure that you have complete compatibility with these materials um, ahead of your manufacturing. Otherwise, you may end up with a you know, significant loss, ve vector loss. You may not lose volume, but you'll lose um, your ve vectors in the process. So keeping that in mind becomes a critical um, preparation as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into the 
failing operation, I think someone will talk through, but that's another source of uh, product loss uh, to transition from your filtered product into your know, filling operation. But certainly uh, do anticipate that you will lose some volume uh, as you fill product and, and the in line hold up. I think the system to mach filling machines, pretty automated, probably couldn't recover as much of the material, but the the length between your filtration uh, or your, um, your reservoir, your product reservoir and your fill needle, you have to consider that to make sure you have the shortest line possible to minimize all that values. I think that is not my, my five minutes, if not more. So I'll yield to the next uh, presenter. Hello, my name is Matthias from Optima. Before I start explaining a little bit what we specifically developed for such kind of application, let me introduce quickly Optima. So with four divisions, you can see on the left side, consumer, life science, non-warmance and pharma. I am here representing pharma. The company is a private owned company, 2,600 employees. The pharma division itself, 800 employees approximately. And we have three sites and our Capability, what we're covering overall is, of course, sterile aseptic filling, isolators, containments, freeze trial, diagnostic, non sterile filling. That's also, of course, starting from lab scale up to, of course, high speed applications. Going a little bit more to the cell and gene therapy, there we have two fields. One is more the production solutions where we build equipment for autolog, allogen. So this is more to the clinicals, to the lab where we help and develop, help together to optimize a little bit more on bench top or <clears throat> laminar flow hood working. So into a little bit more automation to get this more productive, let's put it this way. The other field we're having is then more the filling solutions where we have here uh, fully automatic machines going from let's say five to six units per minute of course, then up to 40, 50 units per minute. And saying that, there I specifically would like to highlight a machine which we developed, <clears throat> let's say, a couple years ago, together with several companies from the cell and gene field, which had already experience with the equipment they have, with the need they have, and just as my colleagues up front presented, with their challenges. So based on this, we have here such a layout where we have at the front basically the, let's say, the unpacking. As you know, there is, for example, normal uh, glass vials in trays, but also quite challenging vacuum packed plastic vials, which are make life for automation not so easy. Then the second half of the equipment here is then basically the fill and finish. So let me start going a little bit more deeper into it. So there is here, we call it the MTC, material transfer chamber means that's a chamber for fast VHP. So you can bring in there the material, so the packaging material, the vials in the tray, vials in the bag, and VHP them, of course, multiple of them, and then unpack. That's basically a batch process where you're coming in into the isolator, the equipment is here in this case completely covered, isolated. Of course, you would like to have the highest sterility assurance. Then we have here then a kind of a semi-automatic debagging with a lid liner removal with support of flip table turning around so that you have, of course, as an operator, the minimum risk to put your hands above the open container. Nevertheless, also addressing here that you need certain flexibility, as I mentioned, vacuum-packed materials makes life, of course, not much easier. Going to the next thing, here we have an automatic lifting of the plastic tray. So because now comes the process when you have it out of the bag, out of the lid liner, then here to have not longer an operator involved, so we automatic lifting them, this tray, and then we going in a vibratory feeding. Why going vibratory feeding? Of course, sure, you can go with a turntable, makes your life, let's say, less costly. But on the other side, you have to see these plastic vials, which most of the customers in the cell and gene are using, they have the tendency to tipping over quite easily. And because of that, what is the best solution is a vibratory feeding. 
because with the vibratory feeding, that's common, for example, feeding cartridges, very top-heavy systems or ampoules. With this system, you can make sure nothing is tipping over. So, because you know by yourself, interventions ideally needs to be avoided as much as possible. So going from there, we then take with a robot these linear feeded containers and bring them into the transport system. So here the transport system is a system which have no format parts, fully automatic adjusted by recipe, and it has the advantage it has no back rail. What means no back rail is, of course, on the first thing, when you have, let's say, a stopper falling off the vial, staying there in the rail, there's no risk for squeezing in the vial, breaking the vial, because it's an open rail where you go along with the vial, so the stopper can tip over, so not let's say, getting the chance to squeeze in, to break. But on the other side, for the plastic vials, you have also here the advantage you're not sliding them along on a back rail and getting any scratches. And as said, no format parts for this. So no change over fully automatically. Then sure, of course, there is a 100% in process control. So you weigh before and after filling. But on the additional side, this 100% in process control gives you the possibility at the beginning of the batch to prime into the vial already. This means you're not losing any product because of priming. So the first filled vial is already a good filled vial. Also, then with the redosing means during the production, you're going more sharp on the target fill. And with the 100% IPC, you still recognize if there is a vial below the acceptable criteria for the filling volume and then with that you can still redose. Means at the end you overdosing all the vials less but gaining with that more yield, more vials out of it. Going next of course what is common nowadays is peristaltic pumps. Here we have our own peristaltic pump which is of course with the servo needle dive in completely synchronized and also in, depends, you can also start dosing slower than speeding up and so on. So minimum shear forces fully synchronized with the machine. Next then is a pick and place stopper placement. This stopper placement of course is with a restoppering. Would be a shame when you look, we try to save each drop but at the end we lose a while because of stopper missing. So here you have the possibility with restoppering and then still getting alert if the stopper is missing so that you can react and do not lose anything. Next thing is then when we're coming to the capping. On the cap itself, you know, these uh, aluminum caps which are usually very common, these aluminum caps are used <coughs> uh, in the industry, are common in the industry. So these aluminum caps have the tendency when you get them delivered, be banded in the back and so on. And so with that, we have here a cap roundness control at outfit of the sorting bowl to make sure that there is not coming to the wild any banded caps. Of course, then with that, the cap placement is also we are pick and place, which gives us the chance for recapping. No? And then outfit. Of course, the outfit here is also completely formatless, means there is a star wheel which automatically adjusting to the size of the vial. And then we have here a discharge, sampling and also a recheck. Coming a little bit then, in addition, as we said, we have built, of course, our own isolator. This has the advantage, we have everything completely in our hand, means we're doing upfront then uh, VHP, cycle development, simulation, simulation with airflow, simulation of the VHP, and having then in the integrated FAT completely a full FAT, what's the purpose of a FAT? Means you can then at this time already test maximum, so minimizing risk and having a very fast startup on your side because the VHP cycle is on our side already developed. And with our decoupled system, it's a very fast cycle. As mentioned before from Nick, a lot of batches, smaller batches, so it depends if this is then important to change over. So VHP cycle on such a machine, maximum one hour. So looking at the time here, I have a little bit summarized, of course, handling of all kind wilds, vibratory plate, as I said, with the robot, no format parts, no scratch, no breakage, weight dosing, redosing, minimizing product loss, 
the restoppering and also recapping, roundness control, and then integrated <coughs> with an FAT and a fast VHP cycle with upfront simulation. That's a little bit which we develop based also from the input from our customers. And of course, if you are interested, we can also show more details in a, let's say, face-to-face -face or in a specific call. Thanks. Uh, my name is Lars Waldman. I'm a staff engineer with uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, Viral Vector Services. And um, I've previously worked in a uh, manufacturing uh, group here at uh, VVS. Uh, before I go into that slide, I just wanted to um, add two comments. Um, yes, it's really important to, uh, to check the um, single use will get as used because um, in some cases you may only have 100 uh, milliliters of uh, fill solution. And if you lose 10 milliliters in your single use fill kit, then of course you miss out on a lot of vials potentially. And the uh, other um, thing that I would pay attention to is the whole product stability because uh, typically while filling speed is not uh, not as critical to us because product may have limited stability at the end. And um, it's more critical to develop a workflow for uh, visual inspection, uh, sampling, and labeling afterwards because a lot of times the uh, products can only be kept for a relatively short period of time um, at room temperature for those. Activities. I wanted to, uh, to discuss some aspects around a uh, fill finish project or uh, facility for uh, fill finish that I've learned over the last couple of years. I've worked for several companies and been involved in several fill finish uh, projects. And um, I want to talk about infrastructure a little bit and about data integrity. Um, it is really uh, important that the equipment is on uh, its own protected network, that it is firewalled, so it's kind of an enclave within the corporate network. Uh, who's thinking about it that should be able to uh, ping the fill line because of uh, today's uh, cyber security environment that is really critical. You don't want to have all the answer attack on your um, fill line HMIs that would be a horrible situation. So it is really important to, uh, to keep that network separate, but you want to be able to allow the uh, vendors uh, like Optima, for example, to have access to your network uh, for diagnostic purposes and for um, PLC software updates. It's easier if they can remotely take a look at the servo system uh, instead of having to dispatch a technician that has to travel to your site first. But it is important that uh, the beginning access is uh, really disconnected. The standard function should be that it's disconnected and you're only connected after you've made an arrangement with a uh, vendor. Um, the other part, um, we are buying equipment, let's say today, that is the latest and greatest uh, Windows 10 with um, today's hardware that's available. Most of uh, the facilities uh, we built are supposed to have a lifespan of 20 plus years. Um, our challenge will be that, of course, you will have components fail over time. And um, so one challenge is to protect this equipment against cybersecurity threats. Uh, we don't know how safe Windows 10 will be uh, 20 years from now. And the other challenge is to actually keep the equipment running. And uh, it is important to keep an eye on when does the vendor disconnect the industrial PC that's used in the equipment that's probably a good time to stack up of uh, resource units so that you have them available as when the equipment
different fields. Another um, aspect I've learned in um, those projects is to really team up early on with IT. They um, probably have never dealt with equipment like that. So it's, uh, it's important you uh, explain the details to them, what, what it entails and um, how big the IP address space should be. It's also important to make sure all the vendors actually set up their network within that space. You don't want to have um, the um, autoclave set up the network and the phone and then set up the own network. You have to make sure it's all one big unit that uh, later on um, you are able to uh, use uh, this network for uh, manufacturing execution or um, electronic batch record system if your organization decides to implement a system like that. For that, you may want to um, also put equipment such as balances and pH meters uh, on more network. There are adapters uh, from ethernet to uh, serial ports, for example, so that you're later able to capture uh, data output from a balance in the electronic record. And uh, another aspect that uh, requires some consideration is to uh, deploy wireless access points uh, throughout the facility. Challenge is that uh, most of the clean room panels that I use there corrugated uh, aluminum, um, and you essentially have a big Faraday cage that is difficult to penetrate with. Uh, Wi-Fi wavelength from the outside. So it's uh, important to uh, discuss with IT how to uh, mount access points and how to uh, maintain them in the uh, clean room for cleanability. Um, and for data integrity, I um, just want to highlight a couple items quickly. It is really important to um, prepare drive images of all hard drives involved. That's important for disaster recovery because uh, it's not a question when hard drives will fail. It's, um, it's not a question if they will fail, it's more a question when they will fail. And uh, they will probably fail after a couple of years. And if you have those images, you can get the system back up and running in a relatively short time period. Whereas if you don't have that, you have to contact the vendor and that is a lot more complicated. The other part of software that needs to be secured is uh, the PLC software and also parameter setting of certain modules. But it's important to really verify that all this information is available so that the system can be uh, restored uh, these days, a lot of organizations they use highly automated equipment like Overland have produced this nice um, PDF document at the end that we include in our batch records. Um, but the original databases are typically SQL type of databases and they need to be backed up because they still represent the original data. I know we can. Um, argue about that, but um, the audit trail that the system generates, that is definitely an original database that needs to be uh, updated in the, um, with a backup strategy that needs to be developed with IT. And I've um, actually participated in the inspection practice would look at the log book of KSC on September 9th. Equipment showing data just to uh, confirm that yes, data has been preserved and it's available. And uh, for use of um, electronic batch record system, we typically order equipment with uh, the capability to push uh, PDF uh, files to a higher order system later on. And um, I would also advise to test that capability early on, um, if possible, just 
um, doing SAT, we have a lot of vendor support available and it's really important to verify early on is that, uh, does that transfer of data work as intended? Thank you. Hello, my name is Tatiana Nanda, and I'm a director of program leadership and Center for Breakthrough Medicines and Discovery Labs. CBM is the contract development manufacturing organization specializing exclusively in cell engine therapies. We're located in the heart of the Silicon Valley, which is the larger Philadelphia area, and we're occupying the former GSK headquarters in Upper Marion, Pennsylvania. In CBM, we offer an true end-to-end -end supply chain, starting from in-house plasma development and manufacturing to viral vector production and cell processing crop preservation and further logistics. Besides development and manufacturing, we also have in-house analytical development and testing. And it's not only common QC methods for release and stability, we're also offering very unique characterization assays such as um, AUC, mass spectrometry, and next generation sequencing. Our location in Silicon Valley allow us to access true top tier talent from leading cell engine therapy companies and um, universities. In addition, we established market leading partnerships with leading and world renowned academic institutions. And we in CBM position our customers for further growth, but not only satisfying the current demand for manufacturing spaces, but also allowing flexibility for their further growth and their further expansion in needs for office manufacturing or lab space. So one of the areas of our particular passion and expertise is cell therapies. Can we go on the next slide, please? Allogeneric cell therapies is the field where incredible successes have been made in scaling up of manufacturing process, where hundreds to thousands of doses of cell therapy can be produced in a single batch, which is definitely a significant improvement comparing to autologous cell therapies. However, those successes in scaling up upstream and downstream are still met with bottlenecks during cell finish processing. And those bottlenecks or challenges, they arise from the fact that cells are formulated in DMSO. And in this formulation, cells have extremely short room temperature stability, maximum two, three hours. And during these two, three hours, we have to fill finished cells, we have to inspect them, and we have to send them for cryopreservation. So in order to enable all those steps within this very short two, three hours, we need to meet several requirements. First of all, a very careful selection of appropriate primary container closure needs to be made. Traditional cell therapies um, filled in the bags and that worked very well for all the cell therapies. However, more and more companies now start looking into using vials as an alternative as those provide more high throw output processing when it comes to fill finish. In addition to container closure, very early on in the development, when the process just start being established, it's very important to work with the right manufacturers to, to establish efficient filling capabilities that would allow to fill up to hundreds. Of course, it depends on fill volume, maybe high tens, 100 vials per minute. In addition to fill finish, um, very robust attention has to be made to inspection. Keep in mind, cell therapies are not the clear solutions. And inspecting those vials, inspecting those drop product containers become a challenge. In this case, a combination of um, efficient automatic inspection for cosmetic defects has to be established with manual inspection of visible particles. So both of those steps has to be implemented in order to be able to quickly process the vials within a very short period of time. And last, but definitely not least, even though it's not a part of fill finish per se, optimized cryopreservation cycle is critical in order to be able to process large 
batches of autophilogenetic cell therapies. Custom cryopreservation cycle has to be established very early on. It will depend on drug product format, on the size, concentration of drug product, as well as the batch size. And besides cryopreservation cycle itself, you need to make sure that you have very uh, robust, very high capacity controlled rate freezers in place in order to, uh, to be able to freeze multiple vials at the time in order to avoid subplotting of your batches. So as you can see, cell therapy, allogeneic cell therapy process is not straightforward and it requires a lot of custom specific solutions. We here in CBM would work with you as the client and we'll make sure that we will take into consideration all specifics of your drug product in order to develop the best cell finish process. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your presentations. Um, I think even after a couple of technical difficulties, that was a great introduction to the discussion segment of today's webinar. Before we do get started, as I see we already have a few questions lined up, I'd just like to remind the audience that you can submit your questions to our panelists by the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. So first of all, we have a question for Matthias. Um, what will be the product loss at the end of the batch for a line as you described? Uh, thanks for the question. I think that's a quite tricky one because it depends very much how you make your design of the disposable product pass. So, of course, at the end you have the bag itself, it's wetted, uh, the surface is wetted, that you cannot avoid. The hoses gets completely emptied, so of course it's important to keep the hose length short. So there is usually, I would say, between two and five milliliters which you lose because of the wetted surface. That's all, everything else you can fill. Of course, the last filled vial is a loss because usually you're running out of product and have not a complete filled vial at the end of a batch. Lovely, thank you. And for Tezfu, um, what are the challenges with selecting primary container closures with gene therapy products? Uh, good, good question, thank you. Um, so a couple of challenges. One is, I think, um, with Tatiana, we spoke about shelf life and, and some of the uh, vectors or uh, if you're working with cell, cell therapies that have a very short uh, shelf life and, and you're working with frozen products in, in most cases. So one is you know, making sure you, you select a container closure that can withstand, if you're freezing to minus 80, that can withstand minus 80 temperature. So in most cases, glass valves are probably not your best option here. You're probably looking at uh, polymers or CZ valves or some other polymers. Um, also, some of the glass <clears throat> manufacturers are coming up, coming up with creative ways to coat these uh, glasses to behave more like uh, polymers. So those are a potential option. The other is really compatibility, right? I mentioned in my slides, uh, you could potentially lose, uh, you can have absorption of vectors into, um, on the glass surface or the material surface. So making sure you've done some due diligence uh, that you have 100% compatibility with the uh, container closure. So I would say, to, you know, th these two are the main ones um you know uh ultra low temperature compatibility and uh absorption would be your main um areas of concern and, and on top of that obviously con container closure and other you know the typical uh container closure selection process making sure you have you know for example if you have a stopper that's not rated for minus 80 you can lose container closure and lose stability so that has to be part of the assessment but that should be a given i think and in, in most cases anyway Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on quickly now to Tatiana. Um, cell and gene therapies require in-depth knowledge of the product and process around them. How can CDMOs help overcome the challenges in cell and gene therapy products discussed in this webinar? It's a very good question. Indeed, every single cell and gene therapy product is different. And very frequently, innovators have the most in-depth knowledge about their products and the specifics. And very frequently there is a question, should we manufacture and develop it in-house because that's where all the knowledge resides or should we work with CDMO? Well, I can tell you how we help with that. Um, we work very closely with our clients, trying to make sure that their knowledge is our knowledge. We actually have a program called, called Partner in Plant, which is different from Person in Plant. Partner in Plant allows us to work with our customers 
closely, have them on site and learn and have pairs of hands working together on developing manufacturing the product. And besides learning from the clients and making sure that we develop the same level of knowledge, we also have very experienced folks here that developed multiple modalities, manufactured many batches of various scales and processes, and they can advise our clients on what can potentially work or not work for their specific product. So having this very close interaction and combining the knowledge of our clients with our own expertise really help us to overcome those challenges. Thank you. Um, I have one for Nick next. Um, is the market shifting from large contract fill finished facilities to smaller operations co-located with drug substance production? Yeah, I think I think that's an excellent question. Um, in, in my experience, and particularly uh, my field is in facility design, um, I've seen a lot of new facilities coming up that are putting in their own fill finish um, because the scale is smaller um, and it's easier to tune to the specific uh, processes that the company is using upstream for, for viral vector manufacturing, um, as opposed to a CDMO to try to cover um, a wide breadth of different processes. Um, I, I, I am seeing more and more um, fill finish sites co-located with the up, upstream BDS production. Excellent, thank you. Um, I have some more questions that have come in um, that I think we're going to ask Mateus. Um, so first of all, do you have the ability to return VHP back into the clean room, not hard ducted? And how does that work? You can take for an isolated air from the room uh, back into the room. Uh, during the VHP process, there's two capabilities. One is that you're going over the ceiling, over the roof with the VHP during aeration, or you have a catalytic converter and they are high efficient before you bring back the air into the room. So both things are possible, depends on your preference. But that's, so let's say, such a small machine, it's very common to take air from the room back to the room, which means you have, if you have an HVAC, extremely small. Excellent, thank you. And we'll stay with you um, for the next one. Um, zero loss is limited to, uh, to stopping um, and alu caps point or to the vials which which is overfilled um sorry i'm just trying to make sense of that question uh we'll, oh, do you know what we'll move on um Mateus, we'll stay with you what are the com most common reasons for rejects from optimas or from your personal experience yeah personal experience or also feedback from customer side is that <clears throat> these uh, aluminium caps are let's say that's are very common in the industry and used are not, let's say, the greatest design. And with these uh, aluminum caps, it's easy to get them banded. And that's usually the bigger reason for having rechecks that you have a banded cap, which have then cosmetic defects or even a blockage in, in placement. So that's probably the most root cause. And that's the reason why we have their uh, roundness control that you make sure only good quality caps comes to the placement. Excellent. And there's a quick follow-up question that's just come in. Um, how does the product saving feature work? Yeah, it works. I think, uh, as I explained, with the weight dosing at the beginning and at the end of the batch, that you basically do not have an automatic intervention, but on the other side, also the machine fully automatically already fill the first drop into the vial and also at the end of the batch, the last drop. During production with the uh, way uh, or with the 100% IPC, you adjusting permanently your dosing system to keep that extremely accurate and with redosing. Yeah. These are the things which really you minimizing any product losses on, on the product itself. Excellent, thank you. And for Lars, um, we've had a question come in. Um, what do you see as main reasons for not introducing an electronic batch system, rec uh, batch record system? Um, I think one uh, one main concern um, of uh, stakeholders is probably that the return of investment is not very apparent because it takes all cross-functional team a lot of effort to establish an electronic system and there really isn't an immediate um, return of investment um, visible. 
and uh, but I think that that happens because um, people may not look honestly at their past executed batches that they see okay on average we have let's say two deviations per batch that we had to deal with their other the occurrence of those deviations in the first place. And so I think it's um, it's those factors that probably everybody feels like they're overwhelmed already with their day-to-day -day tasks. And now they need to learn a new system on top of what's, uh, what's used already. And um, sorry, I wanted to add one sentence to a previous uh, question about materials. Uh, there's one class manufacturer that now offers an aluminum silicate uh, formulation uh, instead of borosilicate that has very good uh, properties for cold applications. And then in addition, they have a class that could be class combination. Um, we have more common for for cold applications excellent thank you we had a few technical difficulties there um but i think we caught the essence of uh what you're explaining there so thank you very much um we're going to come on can, can i add to that real quick absolutely so, so, you know, I think that spans um, not just fill finish, but, uh, you know, the entire viral vector manufacturing process is the challenge of, of electronic batch records is that there's a lot of process change going on, even within a given company and to, um, to develop an electronic batch record and, and capture the appropriate critical process parameters, um, I think is difficult um, to do up front. I've seen a lot of companies being, um, future proofing their systems to be able to uh, to get to electronic batch records, but not right off the bat, um, just because of the process changes that are going on. Excellent, thank you. Um, I have a question for the floor. So anybody, please feel free to jump in for this one. Um, regarding data, is labeling or identification of a container um, on a unique single container basis a relevant topic? Let me quickly jump in here. Absolutely. <laughs> so, <clears throat> of course, most of the projects here, what we're seeing on such machines, you coding the vial after getting filled. That's uh, more or less common because then you make sure that in the warehouse you cannot mix it up. But we see also industry, and I think uh, specifically here, we see companies coming more and more that the vial already have a code when it's getting uh, supplied to you before getting filled. So then you can, of course, when it's a code, you can read in the code and then you can get really the vial, all the data. So when it's getting filled, was there an intervention? When it gets closed, when it gets capped? And now it comes where you have a really lifetime in combination with the whole process of the line. So at the moment we have one project like that, but I'm pretty sure this comes more and more specifically for the cell and gene. It really would make sense. Excellent, thank you. Um, I just have one final question as we are running out of time. Again, from Matthias, could you perform oxygen analysis in line after stopping, stoppering? You know, uh, of course, this would be a great thing to measuring the headspace, analyzing the headspace in line. But at the moment, we have to see that it's depends on the speed, not, not accurate and fast enough. Of course, if we're coming down to a machine where we're talking about five a minute, then you can do that, then you are up to speed. But if we're talking about the machine, and, and as it was mentioned already, certain products you have to fill fast to get it really into the vial fast with a speed of 20, 30 a minute, then it's uh, not really in line at the moment, accurate enough for doing that. Thank you. And just one more for you, Matthias, as it's just come in, um, snuck in just in the nick of time. Um, what average format changeover, including isolator, deco time, um, would you use when switching formats? Or what's the average format changeover? Of course, let's say that the format change here, 
worst case scenario, if you have to change the stopper size, uh, cap size, would be maximum on such a machine, 45 minutes, one hour. That's really max for the machine, but you have to look at the whole story. Whole story means the turnaround time. At the end of a batch, you have to clean up, you have to take out, make a swap test, taking out uh, the old stoppers, let's say the pre before used one, before used caps. Then you have to see also glove integrity test, then closing VHPing the whole machine again, then changing the liquid product pass in this way that you have with closed isolator, assemble the peristaltic pump hoses, the flex bag and so on, probably then having also the petri dishes. So there we're talking about such a machine turnaround time around about five to six hours. Excellent, thank you. Well, as we've uh, come up to the hour now at the risk of running over, um, unfortunately, that is all that we have time for today. So I do apologize if we did not get a chance to address your questions. Um, we will be sure to follow up with you offline. Um, before we wrap up, I would just like to take a second to thank our panelists for their insightful presentations and answers to our questions. As always, you can access this webinar on demand via the Facilitate website, along with many more of our previous webinars and other insightful content. Until next time, thank you for joining us today and goodbye.